This event is going to be about the scuba diving industry and the role it could and maybe should play in marine conservation. So that's what it's going to be all about. But uh, we also have exciting news because for the first time we can unveil the results of our global economic study and value of the diving industry and the assessment of the what we call Atlas Aquatica, which is the, the distribution of the diving site for the lake protection level. So exciting things, but first I would like to present you the awesome panel that we assembled today, who participated in the study and are helping us with this initiative. So we have Dr. Anna Schubauer, who is a research associate with the Fisher Economic Research Unit at the University of British Columbia. She has a lot of experience not only with academic environment, but also with NGO environment. And she applies her research in an interdisciplinary way, which allows her research to be particularly impactful from the local to the global level. And also, uh, her alma mater is in Bremen, University of Bremen, Germany, but she got the PhD here in uh, UBC. And she worked in Peru, Falkland Islands, the Galapagos, Mexico, before moving to the Sunshine Coast here in Canada, which I thought it was a, go a joke, but it is called Sunshine Coast. <laughs> I was sure it was a joke. But... <laughs> she, she is also the leading author of the global study, so she's going to tell everything about that. Thank you, Anna, for being here. And then we have Dr. Andres Cisneros Montemayor. He's from Guaymas, Mexico, so nice. And <laughs> much more so. <laughs> and he is the deputy director of the Nippon Foundation Oxford Ocean Nexus Center. It's a very long name in English, sorry. <laughs> One of the largest research network uh, in the world. Thank you very much for being here. Yeah, Andres has a plethora of published, uh, relevant published studies from fishery economics to ecotourism. One of that, especially for shark conservation, was particularly influential. And one of the least was, um, uh, but not least important, was the, on the blue economy and how we can make it more equitative and what are the enabling conditions to do so. So it's a great addition to the team and uh, thank you for being here. And then we have uh, Dr. Rashid Sumaria. Uh, I think we should have <laughs> a side event just to <laughs> list the achievement of Dr. Sumaria. <laughs> so, <laughs> I don't have enough time, sorry. <laughs> I'll try to summarize. <laughs> he's a professor of ocean and fishery economics at the University of British Columbia, and also is the director of the Fishery Economics Research Unit at the Institute of the Ocean Fisheries, a lot of fisheries. And he was recently had the great honor uh, of being named as a fellow of the American Association of the Advancement uh, of Science which publish a small journal that I don't even know is called Science, so <laughs> that's the most prestigious academic in the world, so congratulations. But it is well deserved because his research was so impactful, integrating the ecology, in the economy, bring it into disciplinarity into his research, and to ensure that resources are sustainable, uh, are sustainably managed into the benefit of the future generation. So thank you, Dr. Sumari, for being here. Then we have Ian Campbell from Paddyware. He has more than 20 years career in marine conservation and he is a marine biologist. He used to be a commercial diver and he has very funny stories about uh, commercial diving. <laughs> and, but he really has been a leader in shark conservation, shark ray conservation in the Pacific. And also he has been working as tech specialist and he has been aiding the Fijian government and also in the CITES was uh, very groundbreaking in the work, the data and work that they've been brought. And now he's associate director of policy and campaigns in Paliwer, and he leads the development and implementation of conservation projects and initiatives. So thank you, Ian, for coming here. Thank you very much. And least but not uh, least, last but not least, uh, Virgil Zetterling is, is um, well, he founded and co-founded so many powerful, strong initiatives that, again, I don't know if I have the time to list them all. But we will try. Uh, is um, an expert in cutting edge technology from remote sensing, and he's also been designing projects for Google, National Geographic, and if that's not cool enough, he served as a developmental engineer uh, and program manager for the Air Force Research 
Air Force Research Laboratory. So he has the technology to find you guys. <laughs> <laughs> he most recently, he co-founded uh, Concept.io and he's the director of Protectasis, who has been uh, an amazing help in this project and he's gonna tell all about that. So please uh, give an applause for the founder. <laughs> Before starting the panel session, I will introduce myself. Um, I coordinate the Atlas Aquatica initiative that tries to bring upon the diving community, scuba diving community, for the conservation of the ocean. I am Fabio Pobretto, I am a postdoc, uh, a postdoc at Scripps Institution of Oceanography in San Diego, and I am the chief scientist of the Center for Marine Biodiversity Conservation, which is hosting this event. And um, I also would like to introduce another member of the team that could not be here, unfortunately, who is Dr. Octavio Butto, who is a professor at Scripps Institute of Oceanography. And it was really an uh, important point of gravity for all of us. Uh, it, was, uh, it started this event, unfortunately, for many reasons it could not be here, but I tried to bring him here anyways, right? <laughs> And also, he is a National Geographic Explorer, and if that's not enough, he also is a famous photographer, one of the most impactful conservation photo photographs in maybe the, dec the last decade is this one. Tells the story about Cabo Pulmo, a small fishing village in Mexico uh, that um, overexploited the resources. It became a, a water desert, unfortunately, so the fishermen themselves empowered themselves protected the area, and this is the result. And Octavio was there to witness that, we published articles on that, and then I think that uh, was an impact for all the people that have been in Cabo Pulmo and in Mexico as well, to witness it, and me as well, that we understood that diving was then now an important resource for the community in Cabo Pulmo that elevated their livelihoods. And so one, of, one simple question that we had created this ripple effect and basically created all this group. So this question was, why there is no map of the diving site? <laughs> that was back in 2018, simple question, right? Now everybody's talking about it, but in 2018 it wasn't as cool as now. So, at that time, it was a very good question that we didn't know, right? I couldn't answer, he couldn't answer. So, we did it in Mexico. We presented the Atlas de Buceo, or Diving Atlas, that features all the diving sites that went all around Mexico, and also, we gather data about marine protected areas, other metadata that can be useful to measure those diving sites. And we also assess how many of diving operators, diving centers go on those diving sites, right? And from that, we were able to estimate their economic output. And actually, we didn't think it was such a big deal, to be honest, at first. We knew it was good money, but the greatest result that we had from this is that is worth as much as fishery in Mexico. We expected it was worth a lot, but not that much, to be honest. And that created a bit of ripple effect. We, we, we had a good uh, communication coverage, especially with our sister um, communication initiative, Mare Mexicano, and Data Mare, who created these beautiful graphics. So with all this, we also estimated that in Mexico, it seems that 51% of the diving sites are protected, so good job, right? Awesome news. But then we <laughs> partnered with protected seas, and we actually realized that only 7% of that is fully protected. What does it mean, fully protected? It means that they cannot do fishing or extract an activity that can damage the diving community, right? So really we have a lot of work to be done, and there's a lot of reason uh, why there is that 44% and that's the challenge that we have to implement. So that's part of the Atlas Aquatic Initiative, a UN uh, decade action. We have been backed by National Graphic Distances as well, and Ocean 5, so thank you. I know there's somebody from Distances. And um, also all these other organizations from researchers and NGOs. I mean, we could have done this without you in this space, so thank you, everyone. And from this, now we can unveil for the first time what we did worldwide. So this is the first map that you can see of all the diving sites in the globe. And of course, how much of that is protected? We didn't know. Unfortunately, most of those are not protected. 
okay? And a lot of them are minimally protected and just a few are fully protected, right? That's what it means, really, because we put names, but I think this figure is from the MPA guide made by very, very good researchers as well. I think this is a very good and powerful communication tool because this is what we want to see. This is what divers want to see, right? And now, right now we are here, so the next question that we're posing ourselves right now is how we bring this here, okay? How we go back to this situation, okay? So we're thinking about creating business models and we're gonna discuss this after we're gonna unveil also the global uh, value of that, how we can bring this protection, this unbalance towards the right. One important thing is that we understand the path and we all work together to be able to have a guidelines. And these guidelines have been drawn upon by our knowledge of how the diving community is working worldwide. There are a lot of examples, a set of examples that I bet that you know many, but these are fragmented. So the first thing we have to do is to organize, oh sorry, is to organize the sector. I'm very bad at this. So organize, um, the sector so it can be recognized, right? It can have right of use, right of exclusion, or the right to ask for increased protection of the areas. And then they have to modernize, be more transparent, share results, share data, monitor themselves to be sure that they are not damaging the nature as well. And then they can access financial subsidies mechanism that can help their business, make it more sustainable and equity, which is very important in a business like diving that can be very expensive and foster the next generation, because this is not just a one-day thing. It needs to be sustainable over the long term. So we are designing this, and we are working with this in Mexico, and we think that this can be significant change. But now, I think everybody wants to know what is going on in the, in the world, so I'm gonna leave Anna to discuss this. Thank you very much, Anna, please. <laughs> Right. 
economic activity. This is just for the dive operators, the money the dive operators make. And um, we didn't look at costs, we didn't look at profit. So this is just what's being brought in through the dive operators. And it includes um, certifications, um, as well as gear rental, and then the actual dive trips um, from Liverpool as well as city trips. And because we had um, only those 81 countries covered, we um, run an economic model uh, to fill the gaps through a um, value transfer approach to estimate the rest of the countries where we didn't have data available. Um, and then we calculated the broader economic impact. So we have data from the World Tourism Organization um, that gets expenditure, so how much money would a tourist spend on average per year? And then we multiplied that with the number of dive tourists we knew were in each country to get um, a wider economic impact. And then we added both the revenue, the direct expenditure by the divers and the, the dive operators <coughs> with the um, kind of wider expenditure that tourists, dive tourists do in those regions. And we came to between 8.5 and 20.4 billion US dollars. You can see those are wide ranges because we have this um, global approach and so we run our model and make sure that statistically this is actually um, valid and so it's not just one number, it's a, it's a range, right? And then um, also we ask questions about employment. So in the kind of high season we found there's up to 124,000 jobs are being created through the dive industry annually. So I kind of forgot to mention the beautiful map. Um, so here we kind of looked at the, um, the water, like we kind of just mapped the total revenue. So this is only um, the total revenue that you can see on the map in millions of dollars. And we kind of geographically looked at it and it was kind of nice to see it um, with the economic, um, exclusive economic zones instead of the land. So we can also really highlight um, like the island groups and stuff. But sometimes on maps when you just highlight the land, you can't really see the colors that much. Um, so this is why. Um, we asked some additional questions as well. So we looked at um, uh, main attractions that divers would um, appreciate. So we asked the dive operators that questions on the left hand side. You can see, um, so we split this into geographically, geographically into tropical and temperate regions. So on the left hand side, you can see the temperate here, and these are all the different attractions the reef, fish, coral reefs, cows, etc. In the temperate regions, it's kind of distributed across, and in the tropical regions, you can kind of see the main attractions are coral reefs, and then the biodiversity associated with coral reefs. And then on the right-hand side, this is, um, uh, we asked them how they perceived any changes in the ecosystem over the last 10 years, and we also divided that into tropics and temperate, and so density graphs where you can see in the middle, neutral, they didn't observe any any changes, and then on the right hand side is positive changes, and then on the left hand side is negative changes. So you can see it's skewed towards the left, and especially in the tropics over the temperate. And so um, another thing we were curious about is the divers, uh, the dive operators involvement in conservation, and we found that the vast majority of scuba dive operators are already contributing either local, or regional, or national conservation initiatives, and the ones that don't, they did show interest. So this was kind of also nice side information to the economic evaluation. And then also, we just wanted to highlight that our kind of results show that uh, with the dive op diving operator spread across the whole world, like they're everywhere, um, across all kinds of countries, and they have a stake in healthy marine ecosystems. Um, so they should really should play a key role when it comes to integrating coastal management and the establishment in the new economy. And then also that it's really important to look at their local knowledge, both the divers and the dive operators and the workers and all the stuff they know about the ecosystem, what's going on, and that um, should be fully included in, in the management of the oceans and um, in the decision making of the So that's just like a big rough overview, so I'm going to pack.
know how to wear legs. Yeah, so thank you very much. And, uh, Fabian, right? Fabian. The first time I heard you speaking, you are so fantastic. You had something on your head. Yeah, so <clears throat> scuba diving uh, is an interesting part of the blue economy, right? Uh, the blue economy is, there are many definitions of this, and I define it sometimes as. Any economic activity taking place below water, on top of water, adjacent to water, right? The ocean, if you're thinking more marine, but in general, aquatic. That's what we talk about. So, so scuba diving is one of them. And the, the nice thing about this work is we have seen that there's a strong connection between how healthy your ecosystem is, how the life in the ecosystem is thriving with the fortunes of those in the business of scuba diving, right? So this is nice in that conservation and economic well uh, performance actually are tied together. And I think this is crucial because in most of the activities, this is not the case. Uh, in order to get your economic benefits, you have to wreck the, the, the marine ecosystem. And in some cases like overfishing, in the short term you take, 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 you take the fish, and Portion and this is not the case, right? So that is part. And in general, if you look at the blue economy, this is something that occupies my mind uh, a lot. You can actually divide the activities of the blue economy into those that depend on life in the ocean and those that don't depend on life in the ocean. And I think this is crucial because then shipping can go on in a dead ocean. You might, how many of you want a dead ocean, right? Right. <laughs> but they will try. In fact, they, they think it's a good thing because then they don't get any the hating waves and then we protest and so on. Yeah. Yeah. So we have to watch that. Because then there are those that depend on life in the ocean. And the problem we have here is that those that don't depend on life in the ocean, usually their services. Values. Do you know how much you make from carrying the group from, from uh, North America to Asia or back? The dollars you can count. But most of the services we get from life in the ocean are not like that, right? Think of carbon sequestration. There's no market here. Think of that scuba diving is a bit different, and that's why I like it. We can collect it. The more of it we have, the more life in the ocean because they, they feed it. You wanted me to talk about financing, how to get this going, right? How to get money to support this thing, which is good for nature and good for uh, economics and social stuff. We did a report for the high-level panel on sustainable ocean and ocean economy. And our key goals is to look at obstacles, obstacles to getting finance to go in, right? What are the values? And how do we deal with this? So uh, we, we have up to what? 11 suggestions. So I'll just talk about a few of them. One of the things we can, we need, we need the public and the private sector. We need our governments. You know, people always say this, and I kind of push back when I, you know, the public sector, there's no money in the public sector. We don't have public sector. We have to rely mainly on the private sector. I don't want to accept that. We are the public sector. We can decide to find money to do what we want to do, right? It's not like, you know, we just have to find a way to tax those who have money. And that is a challenge, right? <laughs> that is a challenge. And that's the thing. But economics actually supports that. Give the job to the one who can do it best. Because you get more money. And then you tax them in order to do society's work. So we have done more of the first, but the, it's so hard to tax anybody there. I'm not saying this because I love taxes, you know, <laughs> but you need it for a society to function, right? So we have to we have to that in mind. So if you have a system where the public has enough resources, it will create an enlightening environment to allow the private sector then to do all the things they need to do in a safe, a, a little bit minimize risk situation so you can go in a 
as a private person contribute and make your money and support conservation. So we, we need that. Now the thing about public money is there's a lot of public money going into the system, but in most cases, in ways that harm the environment and ultimately harm people. One of them is subsidies. Uh, we talk a lot about fiscal subsidies, $35 billion was spent. 22 billion of these are classified as harmful subsidies because they encourage innovation. How about we turn this around and support activities like this that actually support those things that we want, right? So that's, that's, that's subsidies. And the fishery subsidies are just peanuts. According to the IMF, the oil and gas sector gets $5.4 trillion of your public money each year as subsidies. For an economist thinking rightly, this just kills you, right? Because the oil and gas sector produces externalities, negative externalities, climate change and so on. So actually what we need to do is tax them, not to give them your money, right? It's the complete opposite of what we're supposed to do. That is a lot of funds that can be used to do good stuff, like paying fishes to catch plastic rather than fish, right? Where do they feed them? So there is money in the system. If you guys, all of us can work, push our politicians and leaders to really put our money where our mouths truly are, then that will get it a long way to supporting activities like this. Capacity building is one of the barriers. In many of these countries, you saw that Africa, some Latin American countries, there's a lot of gap, right? Because they know what is happening. You know, before that, I probably, and me and some of us here came into the business, you go to a meeting like this, they put a global map and say, this is a global study. And you look, you see, North America, US and Canada. <laughs> and you see New Zealand, Australia, and you see, of course, Europe, maybe Cape Town. <laughs> and, and that is the world. I say, come on, that is not the world. And when you talk, you say, we don't have data. But I know people fish, these are my people, we eat fish. Because you don't have data, doesn't mean this doesn't exist. So we need to actually resource these things and, and, and try to get the information we need to manage our global ocean. There's one global ocean. And if all parts of the ocean work, forget it. Nothing works, because the fish don't need this, I remember. The fish go where they go, the whales. Sometimes I want to be fish. <laughs> so, 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 and capacity building is a big one because I tell young Africans, there's a group called our Ocean, Our Life, Our Africa. I talk a lot to them. I say, hey, you know, start small, whatever, learn about finance, learn about accounting, management, start your own little business, be creative, create little bonds, and, and then so on. Involve women and all people, and then slowly we'll have the kind of people we need to do this in ways that are good for nature and people. That is always my mantra. Sometimes we do things that are opposite. We, we give all the subsidies to the big guys. The coastal people are left out to their small boats. And they're desperate, they have to feed their families, so they hang on the last fish. So you are fueling negative relationship between people and nature. Turn it around, let us promote positive interaction between people and nature through economic activities like this. So thank you, your group, for all you do, and I will get off the stage. <laughs>
with 128,000 um, paddy uh, professionals who actually work and train and drive So I'm, I'm sure that that, that range uh, is also going is, to be an underestimation um, for the true, uh, the true value of diving. What role can the dive sector play? Well, it can play a huge role in, in MPAs and the development of MPAs. Uh, the value, you're putting an economic value on, on a sector is what opens the political doors. Once you start putting a dollar and cent value on something, you're then on an equal footing with uh, the extractive processes. So this, this research is actually critical um, to make sure that the, the recreational and the regenerative uh, industries are getting the political uh, the years that they need to have. Um, the recreational dive sector themselves, these millions of divers around the world, they're actually the ones that are under the sea, seeing the, the marine environment happen first hand. Um, even if you're, a, if you're a scientist, you're diving, you're actually a diver first when you're, when you're under there. Divers can play a critical role in citizen science in monitoring what's happening on the seabed. We've got a, an ongoing 12 year program on marine debris, we're going to be launching one on sharks this year. Um, divers can go to specific sites and monitor for any change in there, so they can actually tell whether MPAs are meeting their object objectives or not. So the, the, the opportunity for the dive sector to play a role in this is huge. Um, I have a paper on sharks, which is um, over 10 years old now. Um, but when I was, uh, my previous life I worked for a certain NGO that uh, has a panda badge, I was based in the South Pacific, and we were trying to spend years trying to, um, to work with governments to, to put shark uh, conservation measures in place. And it was only through the papers like that that Ames did a paper on the, uh, the value of shark diving in Fiji, which was $42 million. The minute we started using that language, the Attorney General called us in for a good, you know, good this time. Uh, and we actually managed to get the Fijian government to push this forward through for Fiji. And at the recent CITES meeting, Back in November, um, the government of Panama, you know, with, uh, with I think it was 20 or 30 other governments, putting forward these sharp proposals for, um, for protection for international trade. Um, the actual giving them some values, like the, the aims of uh, Australia and Fiji uh, values, and the Spanish from Indonesia. Um, once you've got that economic argument, uh, some governments that were wavering actually are then talking sense about how these, these features and the, the environment and the water is worth the value. So I'm um, we're just starting the, the journey on, on this value that we have. As, um, as Rashid said, why is my tax dollars, um, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm in the UK, I don't pay dollars, but why are my powers <laughs> subsidizing an extractive process but not regenerative? So it's, it's cost prohibitive, and I know that, I know that the diving sector is, is Western, it's, it's white. In countries, I've lived in the South Pacific, you get um, uh, overseas uh, operators setting up dive centers. It's actually cost prohibitive to either set up a dive centre or even go diving. But why aren't there subsidies to help countries that want to have local people setting up dive centres in their countries? As opposed to if you want an ice factory built, then you know you and I pay for that. If you want to train people uh, to, from no qualifications <coughs> up to become a professional, this is an investment because these people are then earning a higher wage, a higher salary, they're paying a higher tax. This becomes um, a self-paying uh, uh, investment into that industry. So everything that everyone's been saying is a lot more clever people before and after I'm talking, so I will make way for the stage for them. Thank you, Fabio. Thank you. Thank you very much, yeah, thank you. And I would like to call Virgin Zentoli from Protect the Seas. He's gonna talk about how we can enforce those amazing diving, protected diving sites for them. Well, it's a great honor to be here tonight. Uh, very humble in this crowd, and not only because of the great work it's doing, but just because of the, the transformative experience of scuba diving has been in my own life. Whether that's uh, encounters at Capo Pomo that I've had with my Protected Seas team a couple of years ago, uh, swimming with the tarpon in Bonaire and exploring the fringing reefs there. Uh, this encounter, which is still probably the most amazing encounter I've ever had, just uh, about a half mile from the Blue Hole in Belize, literally watching this reef shark get used as a loofah by these horse-eyed jacks as he tried to swim away as fast as he could. All three of these sites do share a lot of things in common. Obviously, there's good ecology, there's the habitat, these uh, fish need to survive, but they also have a, a story about marine protected areas. 
proper regulation and coming in to try to protect these areas. And that's really where protected seas came in. It's funny, uh, around this conference this week, a lot of people had seemingly simple questions back in sort of the mid-2010s. Uh, uh, Fabio talked about where are the dive sites. Protected Seas founder wanted to know how, where and where, but more importantly, how are the oceans actually protected? How are species protected? Uh, heard earlier today from the Allen Coral Atlas. They had a similar question like, where are the coral reefs in a global data set? Uh, so last night, we got to launch uh, our Protected Seas Navigator, which is the first global regulation database for marine protected areas around the world. Um, eight year effort uh, by the team, over 35,000 individual areas reviewed, yielding about 22,000 global MPAs with verified regulations and boundaries. And again, as an important point by the professor, the, the, the world is more than the developed countries. So we looked in you know, over 220 countries and territories. We translated documents not only in English to be able to distill those into layperson readable language, we translated all that work back to official languages for each country. So this is a resource that's free, it's open access, and it's also available not just in English. Uh, so yeah, 25 languages to date. If, um, regulations aren't enough though. Uh, regulations provide that in one enabling condition, but you also need compliance and enforcement. So the other sort of half of Protected Seas is our Marine Monitor Program, which is a, it's a program aimed at coastal communities. So uh, a lot of great people are working in the big ocean, working on industrial fishing, but uh, those near shore communities, those really highly biodiverse shallow reefs, they're under a lot of, they're under a different pressure, typically. Marine Monitor gives local communities, NGOs, and governments a way to really understand what is the human activity on the water. It doesn't require giving equipment to boaters, it uses marine radar, so basically we can detect the boats, we can take pictures of them, see what they're doing. Uh, it's cloud-based, it works on rangers' mobile phones to access the data. Um, so again, again we, can, we can build them onto existing infrastructure, like in this picture, we can put it in a road mobile trailer that can go about anywhere you can get access to the coast. Uh, Cabo Bomo, again, was uh, one of our earliest deployment locations. We have, continue to have an active partnership there, uh, helping just monitor, again, the activity in that area, doing reporting, and uh, since, uh, through multiple efforts since we put the radar in Cabo Polo in 2019, there's been about a threefold increase in enforcement uh, activity there. So again, trying to protect those areas. So again, I uh, didn't want to belabor the point, but we're very happy to be fellow travelers here tonight uh, with everyone and how we can make scuba diving a more powerful force for good. chatting with people in the hallways, and it's been really interesting to sort of hear how we've um, maybe come full circle and really valuing the ocean for all the different things that it does. But I think for a long time we knew this. For a while it became only a place for maybe fisheries, then it became only a place for maybe conservation, and now we're kind of coming back full circle and saying, but the ocean means a lot of things to a lot of people. But it can be a place for fisheries, and conservation, and indigenous areas, and tourism. And I think something that I really appreciate about this work is working with this sort of team where people are coming at it from all different directions. And so, say for me, um, raise your hand if you're from the White House, where I'm from. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, One? Okay, yeah. <laughs> Two people? So, yeah, yeah, everyone's like, oh my God, are you from right here? Um, I'll say something that has always driven me is for you those who know, White House is a beautiful place, beautiful ocean, really marvelous place to grow up, and yet, uh, Rashid you knows the thing that I've always sort of driven my own work is realizing that there was so much poverty where I grew up. And thinking, wait a minute, if the ocean's right there, if there's so many fish, if there's so much bounty we can get if we take care of it, 
and, and this is the true question that I ask myself when I was like eight years old or something, why do so many kids here not have shoes? Right, like why are people living in houses made of cardboard? Like what, what, why is that? So that's the reason I came to study economics, right? Because I realized this isn't, doesn't seem to be really a how many fish are there issue, right? This is a deeper issue. And I think at the time, this is what, this has been a while ago, I won't say how long ago, when I started grad school, um, there was this big push in this region, right, to have everyone become a tour guide. It's like, oh, okay, that's gonna be the thing, everyone will become tour guides, and we'll bring Americans from Arizona to like look at the fish or whatever. And of course that doesn't work, right? But what we realize now is that it doesn't have to be either or, right? This is what I really like about this project. You know, when we start to look at these, these things that Fabio and, and others have done in Mexico, what we did with the sharks at the global level, whereas, you know, we're not saying that every fisher has to become a tour guide, right? But this is one more answer that we can get. And so now we hear things about blue economy, you know, whether it's blue carbon sequestration, or it's, you know, wind farms, or bioprospecting, or desalinization, all those things are fine, but we have so many industries right now in the water, right there, that are feeding people, providing jobs, and you know, and being sustainable. I think this is what we have to look for, right? And so I think that's the first really big point that I wanted to make. You know, we we sort of run and we get excited about the next big thing, but these things are already there, right? The next big thing is already there in the ocean. People are doing it. A really important part of this, though, and I love you that you brought this up. And when we looked at that map that I put up. This happens everywhere in the world, and that's really important. But at the same time, as Ian mentioned, we know if we've been diving in other places, you know, it's not always, but often expats or people that maybe have a bit more money in these places setting up these shops. And so a really important thing that we have to remember is just like sustainability doesn't happen by itself, right? Equitable benefits are not gonna happen by themselves either. Right, so we can't expect us to put out these big numbers, get people excited, and, and someone in a town like mine, or maybe where you're from, is going to magically make money up here and maybe learn the language of the local tourists and, and put up the shops, right? It's gonna take work as well. And so that's why I love that you brought this up, because if you really wanna have this have real lasting local effects, which I think is what we need for, right, and, and everywhere in the world, we have to think about equity as being something that we actually have to work at, right? We have to be anti-inequity. In a lot of these things, right? These things are just not gonna happen by themselves. That's unfortunately not the world we live in. And so I urge you, just as we're really gung-ho about sustainability, right, and we're realizing that we need regulations, we need accountability, we need transparency, we're gonna do the same things when it comes to equity and environmental justice for any of these sorts of industries. We've shown that can be fantastically profitable, right? If we really want them to have a true lasting impact, they also have to be fantastically equitable in all these places. So I'll leave it there. Big yes or some next. Thank you so much. Thank you for to all the panelists. Thank you very much. It was amazing and an honor to work with all of you and to all also that are in the audience that helped in a way. Thank you also. I forgot to mention Terence Wang, who is also here, who is also part of the Global Education Study. Thank you, Terence, a lot. And now it's a moment for question and answer. I don't know if any of you have a question. <laughs> from eOceans, previously eShark, and um, my question is around data privacy. So we ran the eShark project, eManta, the great Fiji shark count. We collected tens, nearly, well, nearly millions of uh, dive records, and one of the biggest conversation that I have with divers is that they do not want their site on a map because they don't want anyone to go and poach it. And when I see a lot of these free dive log apps, where people are logging the location of cardinal fish, sharks, and then if it's free, who has access to that data? What's the privacy? And so if we're building these software and these technologies, this is what I've been thinking about for 20 years, how do we then protect the communities that we're not least releasing that data? And I think that that's, it does, it's not as important for the protected seas, like the, the boundaries, because that's an enforcement piece. Um, but putting sites on a map, Fiji did not want that. So that was like a very important requirement for the whole project, even at the beginning. Thank you. Uh, do, do you want some 
Yeah, thanks, Christine. I'll say um, thank you as well for the great video shot. I'm so lived there, and uh, sort of worked with Mike and set that up with you. It's been a brilliant thing that what came out. Um, so, Paddy Ware, uh, I've just launched uh, something called a Dock Blue um, that is looking at dive centres, dive operators, identifying dive sites that are important to them and, and showing where they are on a map. And we we encouraging that to show governments how many uh, sites are going to be. We're going to be doing economic surveys at each site to show the value of each site. Now, one of the things that we are careful and cognizant of is this is not us pushing that. This is we've asked dive operators to highlight dive sites that are of key importance, which could be a species, it could be a habitat, it could also be somewhere where they could that's economically important. Um, so they could be somewhere they take training divers, but it could also be a site where there's a particular conservation issue, like overfishing or, or marine debris. Um, we are very cognizant that uh, this is not going to be work for the whole industry, and this is why we're going to hand it over to the, the sector, which is they are comfortable with that. It's not sort of forcing it. You're right, there's a lot of um, proprietor uh, worry about that kind of thing, and especially with, with sharks, we've been launching a shark uh, program so that's based on the, uh, on the great big shark camp that you did. What we wanted to show was the number of surveys. We, you know, we want to make sure that, that, that species abundance is not necessarily publicly available. That's stuff that is held by us and available to governments if needed, but um, we're in very early development stages of that. So I would, I would put it back just to make sure that they know the risks by providing that information. So just when you come from a corporate perspective, but when you come from an academic perspective, you have to have human and animal ethics approval from an institution, but from a corporate perspective, you don't usually need that. Yeah, I, I, yeah. And, and from obviously the public being uh, the, the, the major dive training industry, we consult, Paddy consulted with the sector to say this is what we're doing and there's been a, a Q and A and feedback about what is generally acceptable and generally not acceptable. So we've taken as much precaution as we can. But you're right, it's an important issue. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for the question. And, uh, if you are asking this question in Canada, because of indigenous people, this is US. And I see that most of all, like you said, the universities will, will have to do that, do ethics and do that. And you have to have permission of the indigenous groups to do that with them, otherwise you don't need to do that with them. So, so there are mechanisms for the person that have to be made. The libraries in Canada are connected, actually. One of my colleagues, we had to go to the music libraries, and we showed us a different level what the, the person who the data allows you to do. So, so that's on that side. So I don't know on one side. On the other side, I really think we also have to demand that certain data is made public. If you are having a di diving site on our ocean, you better know it. So, so there is that angle too, right? That I think it's all the time people say, oh, it's so our economic data, we don't want to give it to you. Fine, but this is a common property, we are having access to it, we need to manage it well, so there is some responsibility from the private sector who also make this available. I know, I'm mm -hmm. at the university. I you have to have enforcement, you have to have, like, coming so, from Canada, that's one thing. So, so yeah, but yeah. this is the thing in Namibia, they, 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 they actually have some nice things there where they say, if you want us to give you copa to catch fish, you have to give us information. Because otherwise we can't manage it well for you, you don't own them. So there is that angle. But I take your question seriously, and it's a serious one to, to ensure where we do privacy, we have it. But hey, we can't just make the science public because it's our ocean. Who doesn't actually tell you? <laughs> Thank you for the question. I don't know if there is any other questions for the public? Okay. Are we using the information to advance conservation? Specifically. Yeah. I mean, I think part of the immaturity, I think. One thing I'll say for me personally is um, the 
first thing we need to do is really understand, like I said, not to get carried away with some of the perfectionists. Like when we see something, it's like, oh, everywhere can be a dive site. Right? That's not the way economics works. That's not the way ecology works. And so I think for me, something really important is to um, really use this to get a very good handle on what are the economic benefits of conservation, right? And where do we have the economic benefits of conservation? Now that said, I think that although having these economic gains is really important to sort of uh, communicate to people that may not be as interested in conservation as in them itself, right? Like here in Mexico, one thing is one thing, and another one thing is another thing. Right, so I don't think that a site should have to, like the fish don't, shouldn't have to prove that they're worth money in order for us to conserve them. Right, so I think from where I'm sitting, it's mostly providing information to people to say, hey, these could be some of the benefits. Right, but I don't think that we can rely on this sort of thing as sort of the only argument, right? Because as an economist, you know, market benefits are not the only benefits, right? And, and, and that's something that I, I wouldn't want to push right, from where I'm sitting. Yeah. Um, just, just really, just oh, <laughs> so, like, well, so just really briefly, um, looking at the research that came out, if you, um, you know, there's increasing research that, uh, that areas that are protected or you know, getting higher value and higher return, if the dive set is worth 80, um, 80 billion, um, no, sorry, 20 billion with, with, with 6% protection, can you imagine what's worth is 30% protection? So that's the, you know, it's, it's a bit like the sunken billions that, uh, that came out from the World Bank, that the lost revenue, that, the, that lack of protection um, is, is kind of, that's, it's revenue that's been lost to countries and, uh, and tax and, and, and jobs. Yeah, I would, I, 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 I just want to add to that. Um, there are two strategies, top down and bottom up. One top down is to create this narrative. Narratives are important and they have to be science based. So we can use the data to leverage, right? To create a narrative and make the guy question why we have issue refugees, right? To protect, but we don't have diving refugees, right? We can have protection of the diving sites with that. Because we don't create the narrative. That's one, so top down. But bottom up, we have different pilot projects. And most of this data is needed to justify the implementation of any area-based protection uh, tool or an MPA. Basically, all around the world, there are different regulations, of course, very complex, but most of them has a ground rule of saying how, is, how, is, how much is worth it. Where is it, right? And how, how much you need? These are basically the three questions worldwide is government or any other agency is gonna ask if you want to do IQs. So that's how we're doing that in Mexico. And in La Paz we have one or two pilot studies and we want to start one in Italy and in South Africa as well to have different perspectives, right? And we hope to have more, not to have just, <laughs> just three and say, ah, worldwide it works. <laughs> so, uh, and we want to foster and other initiatives to be to grow up and follow that rules. So that, but that's basically the two top down and bottom up. So it's not a bigger question. Hi. Is it work? Hi, I'm Gala. I'm just wondering um, what, what are the next steps in research in this area? And like would it be worth also doing this for other creational industries?
So yeah, this is something uh, uh, no, I think that, that covered it. It'd be nice to get other questions. Okay. Yeah. One, for example, as next step, um, as the next research step, um, one thing is going to be to create a business model to try to figure out how we can really protect the climate science, at least give different scenarios, right? And then, again, bottom, uh, top down and bottom up, start working with the community. Because we think that community is at the end of the day. At the end of the day, the climate science has to be empowered. So we have to figure it out how to create interdisciplinary uh, panels, like, like with, with not only researchers, but NGOs and social science studies that we know are important. Like we can almost do that. So these are the two main things. Uh, I was recently struck by a recent diving trip where quality of diving was kind of okay outside the MBA, but we paid a lot more to go into the MBA. What really struck me. I just want to say one thing is that most, one of the reasons I believe is that, and there are more experts than I, so I will leave them the maximum, but uh, is that a lot of the money from the MPA sometimes is, is the community is excluded for the money, or feels excluded for the money. Maybe it's not, because really through taxation or other mechanisms, they go, you go back to the community, but they don't realize because they, they don't feel it or they're not included in it. So I think that that's one of the reasons why the forcing of MPA as a business model is more difficult than investing in existing business, right? The MPA not necessarily has to be a business to be justified. Uh, it can exist by itself because it wants to protect, right? But we live in a more world of money. <laughs> so we have to justify this. So that's, I think that's one of the reasons. I don't know if you guys want to add on. Well, I think really quickly something that, that um, go back to something Archie was saying, like often that link between the higher biodiversity and, and protection of some sort of economics, that, that those local communities, the operators, are really part of those MPAs, right? I know for many parts of the world, the MPA becomes sort of a federal government thing. Mm -hmm. You know, and for that to get back to that local community, like, forget about it. Right, and so I think that that's why you see a lot of the late life problems is a great example, but it's almost too good of an example. But in many other templates here in the world, like where you really see this have a very strong effect, is when the community itself is the one that is leading the MPA, right? And so because otherwise, that 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 part of ownership isn't really there, right? And so you might have some benefits from the, you know, if there is, if there are more fish inside, just kind of pure market benefits of I want to go see more fish kind of thing. Um, but there is, it's not seen as a benefit of the MPA itself or having it, right? And so that kind of disassociates a little bit. People think it was like, oh, we have these benefits despite this MTA kind of thing, right? Which is really kind of turned around. Yes. Just um, really briefly, um, the dive operators exist in open trade, so they, the successful dive operators have social license to operate in the country. You know, they, they, they interact with communities, uh, they often employ community members, and they, they're probably more embedded in community than, than local government, or federal government. Um, what there is is a disconnect across the dive industry. I mean, you get two dive operators in a room. If you can get them in a room, you get four opinions on something. <laughs> and also, um, their primary um, sort of reason for existing is to run their business. So just getting that narrative across that um, if you can get sustainable financing models that um, managing an MPA or a protected site that they're benefiting from doesn't necessarily have to eat into their bottom line and their, and their business model. Um, also, there's plenty of willingness to pay you know, survey divers and um, tourists. There's a lot, of, a lot of evidence there they're willing to pay a premium, um, but it's just then how do you extract that premium um, from the willingness of, of 
if anybody comes down to voluntary giving, that's, that's the hardest. Whereas, so for example, like Palau, you pay the $10 tax, or in, in Fiji, uh, you pay $25 special cycle, or your site, Nick, you know, five dollars. That's not voluntary, that's part of your package. It's just trying to work out the economics of that and the value for matching then, making sure the communities have that equitable benefit. Lots of, lots of this week, it's going to take more than a week there to fix that. Yeah. Yeah. I think we have one more question, later. Yeah, um, can you hear me? Yeah. So I just think this was a fabulous um, presentation today, and it was so interesting how you talked about the science and how the regulations are really informing the science and the protection. And I just wanted to make the point, too, that this is a great first start, but really I think the goal could be, and maybe this is not within our particular wheelhouse, is really how do we galvanize the um, recreational dive community to be an equal voice to the commercial fishing community. And once we can have the data to show that, you know, at least in the US, um, you know, when we look at fishing in the US, male fisheries is especially, um, has a nice kinship with the commercial fishing lobbying group. I don't know of a real diving lobbying group. And so when we're thinking about the broader picture of sturdy recreation, I think the work that you're doing and the collaborative efforts could really help uh, collectively improve that. So just thank you for your work. Well, thank you. I don't know if somebody wants to go reply to yeah. 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 Also just one, the most important thing, it is food outside. <laughs> <laughs> you can speak more, we are out of time, but I don't know if you have one more question, but I want to be respectful of the time. Everybody. Yeah. <laughs> I think as diving operation, I think tourism is a good solution for conservation because it can become a problem. We are thinking in Baja, but practices are a very big problem for us. So I think as a diver, we also have to be very responsible and share a lot of good practices and make sure that it's responsible practices because this year Magdalena Bay was a disaster. We had people that almost died. So if we want uh, diving and snorkeling and all these recreational activities as a solution, we have to make it like all like an internal framework where we also push the user to be more responsible because social media is creating a huge problem and we are having people showing in TikTok uh, doing really bad practices and it can be really dangerous, not just for the user for but for the community too. Okay. So. <laughs> So that's an issue that, that we need to tackle for us, Paddy and Paddy Ware. Um, we, a couple of years ago, produced the Responsible Shark and Ray Tourism Guide, which uh, was aimed at operators and divers to, to improve practices for shark and ray tourism. Um, but it's, it, it really is an awareness, I mean, for the awareness raising, that really is for divers. Because what you tend to get is that a diver goes out and sees a shark, and it's not a great dive, you know, regardless of, of the operation or um, components. So that, that, that's on us to, to, to ensure that that Awareness is uh, people know it's not just the interaction, but everything else that goes on with it. I just wanted to thank you for some uh, alarm and giving us some caution because I feel we're all very positive, you know, because the thing is diving is not giving any priority at the moment, right? So we're pushing that. But thank you for telling us this can also be overdone. And I think that's a very good, good one. And thank you for taking the last space and telling us that. So please, whatever we do as humans, you know what? Remember what my grandfather told us when we were playing soccer and jumping and kicking it. He says, hey, you guys, just because you can jump on the ground, it doesn't mean you should do it so humbly. You should walk on earth as if it feels pain. So do the diving carefully because that can also be overdone. I'm really happy you did that. Thank you so much.